What is up, Bitcoiners? How's it going? This is your boy, CK. And today I had an awesome podcast with Keegan McClellan, one of the co-founders of Start9, a really cool and innovative company in the space. Um, guys, this was such a wide-ranging conversation. We kicked it off by talking about who Keegan is, how he's contributing to the Bitcoin space, and what Start9 is building. And then after that, we get into the meat of the conversation, which is all about Bitcoin attack vectors. We talk about the hard things that Bitcoiners typically don't like to you know, mention, like the areas where um, Bitcoin it could be susceptible to be attacked. Many Bitcoiners are very bullish because the game theory is so sound, because the incentives are so strong, and because we think that Bitcoin is going to take down any adversary and go and empower any person. But still, there are things to consider, and Keegan has a developer mindset. So he absolutely understands you know, where deep down in the nitty-gritty uh, things need to be ironed out. So uh, I think you guys are going to really like this podcast. It was one of my favorites. Um, but before we get into it, I want to tell you guys about our sponsors. The Bitcoin 2021 conference this June in sunny Miami, Florida. It is going to be June 4th and 5th, and we are barreling towards a sold out conference. Already one third of our available tickets have been sold and way more than half of our whale passes have been sold. We are almost sold out completely on the whale pass. Um, we have amazing speakers, Jack Dorsey, Chamath, Nick Zabo, Tony Hawk, Peter Todd, many, many more, and many more to be announced. You can go to the website to check them all out. Mayor Suarez has welcomed us into the city with open arms. And again, tickets are flying off the shelves. Seriously, I see the feed and like I've done many conferences. This one is is really has some something going for it. Um, and honestly, guys, like after all this, after 2020, Bitcoiners want to grab a beer, hang out. We're bringing back Bitcoin 2019 vibes times 10 prices times 10. Let's go. Use promo code Satoshi, all caps, Satoshi for 10% off. You can go to the website b.tc backslash conference. Again, that is b.tc backslash conference. And get your ticket today. Today, prices also are going up. And hey, we may just sell out. So we have a hard cap. Can't really be flexible there. Don't wait. Keegan, what is up? Welcome to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So Keegan, for those of you, or for those out there who don't know you, why don't you kind of introduce yourself and talk about uh, what you're building in this space? Yeah, so uh, you know, my name is Keegan McClelland. Uh, you know, online more probably recognizable as Proof of Keegs, both on GitHub and Twitter. But I, uh, I entered the space kind of at a very um, at a vol very volatile period of time in the summer of 2017. Uh, and you know, I, I started off my uh, Bitcoin journey uh, actually working over at Salt Lending, but uh, I'll keep that part of the story relatively brief. Basically, as the as my own knowledge matured and as the industry matured and as uh, salt lending decided to, uh, you know, do things that I believed were less aligned with the future of Bitcoin. Uh, I, you know, we all ended up leaving to try to focus on how to make Bitcoin more usable at scale. And, and that, you know, there, there are plenty of very, very smart people who are working on the core technology in Bitcoin. And, you know, while I aspire to kind of make those types of contributions one day, uh, you know, a lot of our focus has been on things that are closer to the end user in terms of making Bitcoin more usable in the way it was intended to be used. So Bitcoin is, of course, like the, the properties that make it interesting and fundamentally novel uh, are things like the censorship resistance, the level of political influence that you have into your money, you know, say basically calling it sovereign money, um, you know, the idea that you don't have to, you know, depend on others to really uh, audit what is going on around the world. Uh, and the way that we've made Bitcoin user friendly in the past involved a lot of shortcuts, right? You know, things like Coinbase are testaments to this. Like, I don't like, 
we love to, to shit on Coinbase a lot as an industry, I think, but, you know, to their credit, they made it really, really easy to use, but they did it by sacrificing a lot of the principles of Bitcoin, uh, or at least making them more inaccessible than they had to be. And so when we all left SALT, one of the things that sort of was the, the forcing function for what we're doing now was that we were actually trying to set up lightning nodes. And I am a huge fan of the lightning network. I still, to this day, think that uh, paying someone or receiving money on Lightning is one of the most magical experiences you can have. Uh, the, the only one that I remember that was just like that was the first time I sent a Bitcoin transaction. Um, it's just the, the instantaneousness it, uh, along with the trust model uh, is, it, it's really, truly astounding. And if you haven't experienced it yet, I really, really encourage you to do so. But anyway, um, we in the process of trying to set up a lightning node, like, uh, let me, let me step back. When you send a Bitcoin transaction just on chain, uh, you're basically just signing uh, some piece of data and broadcasting it out to the network. And otherwise you can sort of forget about it. You don't have to be online all the time. You don't have to run any fancy stuff. It's like usually an app on your phone and you're, you're done. Lightning represents in the, the technology required to operate on Lightning is fundamentally different. And this has to do with the trust model, which we can get into later if you want. But the bottom line is, is that it requires setting up uh, physical infrastructure and servers and whatnot. So when we were trying to get our own Lightning nodes stood up, Matt, uh, one of my co-founders and the CEO of Start9, basically uh, we were at this for you know six hours and he was just like, how in the hell is anybody supposed to be able to do this? Nobody is going to do this. Um, and that really sort of inspired us to start thinking about how to make it easier for a person to get started on Lightning. And I'm happy to report that as of a few months ago with the embassy, which is the flagship product over at Start9, um, we took what pr a process that you know nominally took at least me, I want to say two to three days to do correctly in terms of both learning about it and actually executing it down to a process that end-to-end -end can take, hmm, uh, if you already have an embassy set up, it will it'll take no longer than three, three or four minutes. And if you don't already have an embassy set up and you have to tack that time onto it, it'll take you less than 15 minutes from unboxing to having a lightning node up and running. Um, so I guess taking a step back, uh, the embassy is like a personal server. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so, so fundamentally, it's just a, a platform for making server software easy to install and to manage, right? Uh, you know, the one of the things that we keep in our heads when we're trying to, to design the product is we're trying to give the iPhone experience to server software. And unfortunately, uh, for better or for worse, really, like the, the last 20 years of UX design has gone into just how to make the, like, desktop slash laptop experience better, as well as the phone experience better. No effort has gone into trying to make end users easily able to run server software because it was a, uh, it was a task that was relegated to experts. And, you know, there are, there are plenty of reasons for that. Server software is fundamentally just harder to run because of the uptime requirements and the networking requirements. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, many of the, the problems that we're seeing in the, in, just starting to surface in the mainstream, but some of us have known for a while, like the deplatformings and the censorship and the you know spying on individuals, right? That stuff is really starting to surface now. And that was all made possible by the fact that we basically made all of software uh, custodial over the last decade or two decades. So we are really after trying to make this platform so that individuals can run their own software so that they're not uh, they're not f at least forced to trust third parties uh, to act in their own interests. I don't expect custodians to ever fully disappear, but having the option to exit is extremely important, and it's been uh, uh, like woefully neglected for quite some time now. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, a little bit of how I think about the space is I think that the Bitcoin revolution is actually a personal server revolution. Um, I think that... Uh, Bitcoin, when it comes to creating the need to host your own stack, um, it's it's an example of Bitcoin fixes this by breaking this. Like we yeah. have currently been kind of dele delegating out 
um, very, very sensitive computing that we really rely on and need, you know, and it's very important to us as individuals, businesses, et cetera, to trust the third parties. And, uh, you know, that's been bad, but now the introduction of Bitcoin makes that even worse and even more risky, like actual yep. values on the line. So, um, Bearer Bitcoin's, asset value. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it can't be rolled back. It can't have all the kind of like fixings of the current traditional system. So, um, you, know, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like the catalyst to bring on that the demand for personal servers and the need for people to want to host them. That's exactly it, actually. Like when we had started the project, it was definitely inspired by Lightning. And like I said, the, the Lightning uh, edition was quite recent just because of all of the technical hurdles involved. But our very first release... Uh, it was about just getting uh, a Bitcoin core node up and running, right? Like for a while, most Bitcoiners were not running their own nodes uh, in terms of just number of people. Obviously, the very prominent ones were all doing it. Uh, a lot of the developers, uh, hardcore enthusiasts still did it anyway. But uh, there were plenty of people who were the, the Coinbase Bitcoiners or the, you know, the, they had hardware wallets, but they weren't running their own nodes. That group of people, uh, we wanted to be able to get that up and running and that was the forcing function for us for us getting started with this but we very quickly realized that hey there are plenty of other things we want to be able to run in a non-custodial capacity and in our basically i want to say second release we had a peer-to-peer -peer, uh direct messaging service over tor <clears throat> something that didn't require any account signups and uh you can send messages to uh, a person at a tor address and there was no one on earth could tell who was talking to whom or decrypt the messages or stop the messages from happening short of literally taking down the entire Tor network all at once, which is uh, quite a feat. So yeah, like we, we it, there are a handful of tasks that I think people will really want to be able to do in a non-custodial manner. And the, the ones that I can think of obviously are finance, but ha having some sort of messaging service, having some sort of file storage service, et cetera. So uh, kind of like, let's let's cap off talking about start nine with kind of describing, you know, what is available now, what is kind of coming forward. And then after that, let's we I want to jump into a, the real reason why you're on this podcast. Um, and that's to talk about Bitcoin attack vectors and areas that, you know, Bitcoin could falter. Uh, Bitcoin magazine and many other uh, Bitcoin oriented uh, folks and content outlets don't really talk about the attack vectors as much as uh, maybe we should. So want to kind of uh, talk with Keegan about some of the attack vectors that he sees. But let's uh, let's finish it up with uh, start nine first. Yeah, I mean, so uh, the I mean, I'll just talk about where you can find us. You can find us at start nine labs dot com. And you know, the, like if you haven't gotten an embassy and you're interested in running a, a Bitcoin node or a Lightning node, I highly recommend it. It's extremely easy to set up. Um, but otherwise, like I'll, I'll let the product speak for itself. Okay, awesome. And like, are there any specific features that you guys are looking to roll out? Like, what exactly is part of like the the Start Nine App Store per se, and and what are you guys looking to bring out? As of today, you can get uh, Bitcoin, uh, like Bitcoin Core. You can get LND or C Lightning. You actually can have a, a choice between which Lightning implementation you use, as well as some Lightning wallets. We have a file storage service called File Browser. We have a uh, that peer-to-peer -peer encrypted Tor messaging service that I was talking about called Cups. Um, we're actually, I think, actually, this is public knowledge now. We are coming out with a literally. As soon as the PRs get merged into the upstream projects, we'll have some. Uh, an instance of Mastodon. So that's, you know, topical with the, the, the happenings in the world recently. So uh, there are, I think there are a couple of other things that are escaping my mind right now. Um, but yeah, the, the, the upcoming ones are, are Mastodon. We also have another thing upcoming, but I don't really want to talk about it yet. Uh, uh, and then as far as core OS stuff, just like things to, to make it easier, faster, more capable. Um, the boring stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you would you like host something like Spectre uh, on uh, on a Start Nine, or is that something that you can just uh, use your computer to refer to your node? Um, it, it can be done either way. Uh, we're having discussions right now about whether it makes sense to put it on the embassy. Uh, it is something that you can absolutely today run Spectre desktop on your own uh, just computer, and then you can have it point to the Bitcoin Core node that's sitting on your embassy. Uh, 
you can also run it run Spectre on the embassy itself, but uh, there there are some trade offs about both speed and uh, convenience to to consider there. Okay, cool. Well, uh, you guys, I know several people who own the embassy and run it, and they are big fans. Um, I I kind of am going through a, a self node exploration process myself, so uh, I'm sure I'll be uh, checking out the embassy as one of the options out there. Um, but it's really cool that it's plug and play and you guys offer like not just a node, right? But um, several options on lightning and then a bunch of other stuff. And Mastodon is topical. Uh, I know that Bitcoin Magazine was thinking about running up a Mastodon instance. And if we could just make it happen with uh, with an embassy, that could uh, that could make it a lot easier. So maybe we got to continue that conversation. Yeah, for sure. All right. So let's talk about Bitcoin attack vectors like you know, how, how, how do you kind of think about Bitcoin from an adversarial perspective? I, I mean, so it, it's all about that. There, there are two main categories of things. There's external attacks from actors who wish to see it fail. Right. And then there's also just, uh, the, 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 fi- the, the failure modes that are the result of actual success. Right. Um, for instance, scaling problems are a failure mode from success, right? And I, I say failure not with not in some sort of final sense, but things like I mean, I'm looking at I, I watch the mempool every day, and we're at one year highs right now in terms of how large the mempool is, and you know the minimum uh, sats per byte you have to pay in the next block is 150 sats per byte, which is quite a lot, um, and those are things that absolutely uh, lower the utility of Bitcoin uh, for certain use cases. Um, So you can argue that those are good problems to have, but we'd also just rather not have those problems and they just require a bunch of work. And, you know, lightning is very much an example of one of the ways that, you know, we saw that in advance as an industry. I can't claim any credit for inventing any of this. Like the people who work on this are are extremely brilliant, uh, hardworking people, but you know, we like they they saw it in advance. They're like, "Hey, this does not add up to this. Like, how are we going to deal with that?" And you know, it required talking about that problem first, and then you know, uh, Joseph Poon and Thaddeus Stryja came up with a, a method of doing it. And then you know, the Lightning Labs and Blockstream teams and the uh, Eclair team all like you know actually came together, put together a standard, and, and built something that that does it, and it works. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I don't want to come off as uh, with the impression that like light the work on lightning is done right it's like it's kind of only just getting started uh but it's an example of one of those things where those 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 failures uh were seen in advance and then engineered for right uh so you know we have you know a handful more of those like with with tesla buying you know a billion and a half dollars in bitcoin like and you know the 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 michael saylor conference last week or 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 there are portents of a tsunami of inflowing capital that are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous if we're ready for it at this time, I have no doubt that, you know, with enough work, we'll get Bitcoin to being able to support use cases at that scale uh, with, and not necessarily have to sacrifice any trust properties, but requires a ton of work. And, you know, that, uh, those are things to pay attention to. So the scale part is one of them. And then the second one is uh, the more, these are less technical. Uh, I, you know, there, there are, there are some technical attack, like external, like malicious attack vectors that are, you, we should always pay attention to. But uh, the one that I actually think about is uh, the short term effect of just uh, an adversarial regulatory environment. So uh, Bitcoin as a as a system was designed to sort of survive any sort of legal hostility, but that doesn't mean that our relationship with it will remain unscathed uh, in that scenario. So uh, unfortunately, that's outside of my area of expertise. I'm I'm a software engineer by trade, and I have a, a I would describe myself as a pleb when it comes to like legal stuff. But uh, you know, th- there are there's so there's plenty of work to be done on the legal side, and you know, to to their credit, uh, we have you know senators that are open advocates for Bitcoin now, which is something that is new and unprecedented and really really good. 
Um, and I just hope to see that that stuff continues because it's far from a done deal that we're going to be able to, to do this in a peaceful transition. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are, are good points. So let's, I guess let's focus in on the scaling before we talk about what I would characterize as attacks on Bitcoiners. You can't really yeah. attack Bitcoin. That's, that's, that's right. That's but, right. It's an attack on a bit on Bitcoiners. Yeah. So, you know, nation states can attack the Bitcoiners that live within uh, their jurisdictions. Um, so that's a better way to kind of think about like, you know, how that process could be really painful. But okay, let's talk about the scaling thing, right? So you brought up an example like, you know, a tsunami of institutional money coming in. Um, you know, what do you have in mind as like being something that Bitcoin's not quite ready for? Well, I mean, it it really depends on the the use cases. I, I I'm actually not convinced that Bitcoin's not ready for it. I'm just it's it's one of those moments where I'm like cross my cross my fingers, man. Like, hope this works, or we'll see how it doesn't, right? Uh, it's I, the good news about institutional capital buying is that at least from what we've seen, that it doesn't look like short-term trades, right? Like companies like uh, MicroStrategy or, or Tesla adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet. I mean, it's not clear. I'm not. I'm, I don't. I'm not the CFO of those organizations, but they're not I, signaling you know, that short-term. They're signaling, they're signaling that it's short-term. a buy and hold. Yeah, and so if they're going to sit on those UTXOs forever, you know, maybe like you know, we're just going to have to sit through a jammed mempool for you know, a month or two, and then things will kind of settle back down uh, and, and and it'll be okay. Uh, or, but if they are trying to like move it at a any sort of like uh, faster rate, then, you know, we can, I, I don't necessarily think that the solutions that we've employed up until now, uh, one of two things is true. Either they're going to probably use custodial solutions, which sort of mask using Bitcoin, right? The, 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 the Coinbase scenario where like if you send money, if you send Bitcoin from one Coinbase user to another Coinbase user, no on-chain transaction takes place. It's just, you know, central databases getting updated and whatnot. And that's not going to get reflected on the, the broader network. So to the degree that these institutions are engaging with Bitcoin in that particular way, uh, we might not see it on a, a technical level down at the network. But, uh, you know, that introduces its own set of risks, because if that becomes the de facto norm for how you use Bitcoin, then we introduce what I would describe as tail risk to the entire network, where it's like if uh, the vast majority of economic value is managed by essentially a couple of nodes, then uh, you might get the situation where even if the majority of users want to fork away, that the majority of capital is on the other network and that the, the, the BTC, uh, you, the, the, you might see a repeat of the fork wars of 2017. So, yeah. um, yeah, like it really, like I said, it really depends on the use case. Um, in the meantime, this is like why I'm trying to to, to focus on on things like uh, uh, off chain scaling, as well as things like even a, things that sound even as mundane as Taproot, right? Taproot ostensibly has the potential to make at least the more complicated setups uh, as low footprint as the uh, the the sort of bare bones pay to public key scenario. And that, that that at least means that we won't have to discourage more complicated uses of Bitcoin uh, from a scaling and fees perspective. Yeah. So, and just to kind of plebify the explanation, um, right now, the more complicated of a like transaction you want to make. So multi-sig is an example of a more complicated transaction. It's literally bigger. It's a bigger transaction. It costs more money. Um, it costs more uh, sats per byte in order for that transaction to actually happen. Uh, so what Taproot does as part of this next upgrade to Bitcoin is it actually makes every single transaction, no matter how um, complex it is, look exactly the same on chain, uh, which helps from a scaling perspective. Anything Assuming it's cooperative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I mean, that, that's exactly right. Um, the the way to really think about Taproot is that it formalizes this idea that's been uh, sort of bubbling up within Bitcoin now, which is that the Bitcoin blockchain is a court system. It's not a payment rail, right? So the idea is you should only have to use it when there is some sort of uh, like dispute, 
And so if the, the fundamental assumption in Taproot is that as long as all of the interested parties agree on what to happen, then there's no script that needs to execute. There's no complicated contract that needs to be evaluated. Because if all interested parties agree, then whatever they say goes, like no one else needs to get involved. Yep. So, I mean, again, from a scaling perspective, like that is scaling, right? Um, going yep. from every single time a contract has to be literally written out to it only needs to really be be broadcasted um, if there's uh, if it's not cooperative. Um, okay, but let's focus back in on kind of like the attack vector. You mentioned SegWit2x as an attack vector. Really what that kind of instrumentalized in is in 2017, uh, it was like the users versus the big businesses that were a part of the Bitcoin industry. Um, yep. And the big businesses wanted to create a non-backwards compatible upgrade to Bitcoin. And the, user, the users effectively you know, through loose signaling across the internet, um, said no. And um, it, it was a long battle for years and it culminated in 2017 um, with uh, the user activated soft fork effectively a way for the users to upgrade Bitcoin without um, doing the not backwards compatible change. Uh, and that's kind of how that ended. It also created Bitcoin Cash. Uh, which is now trading at less than 1% of a Bitcoin. So an utter failure. Um, but that's kind of the summary of that instance. Can you kind of talk about how a repeat of that could happen? Maybe let's just call it uh, the institutions versus the users or the US government in, um, in Europe versus the users, like in order to upgrade upgrade Bitcoin in a non-backwards compatible way. Yeah, so let, let's talk about why non-backwards compatible changes are are so controversial to begin with. And the reason is that because when, when something is non-backwards compatible, it forces everyone to upgrade. And when you force everyone to upgrade, you have this, this moral hazard, so to speak, of who has, in, in a system with no central authority, who has the authority to decide what changes go into a non-backwards compatible change? Um, the one that took place in 2017 was something that was just a, a block size increase. So that might sound benign, but it did also like it did fundamentally change the cost structure, both for it was a, a tension between the cost of validation and the cost of transaction. Um, the, the, the big businesses wanted the larger block size because they were losing business by having a high cost of transaction for their users and they could afford the higher cost of validation uh, because they had you know more sophisticated uh, you know technical teams that could do this but it definitely was coming at the expense of the user being able to validate things which caused that centralization pressure um, so and really quick, the whole point of Start9 is to enable users to validate the Bitcoin correct, blockchain. Correct, yes. So yeah, it's we, actually counter to your entire business's goal. It is, yes. From, from, from my perspective, I think that the, the real magic of Bitcoin is that everybody re has a, a, a real say in the rules. And uh, that, but, but you know, in, in, the, in the old adage of freedom isn't free, like you have to, you have to fight for it, right? You, you, it's not that every user gets a say just because they happen to use Bitcoin. You have to run the node. You have to use Bitcoin in such a way that your node is your source of truth. And that's both, that's not just a, a cultural thing that we have to learn, but uh, it's a, it's a property that we should fight to preserve at a technical level. Um, however, in these sorts of uh, uh, contentious scenarios, let's say, where, uh, you know, to, just to, to sort of spitball, let's say like four or five nodes are running the transaction volume and the uh, they represent the uh, total capitalization of like 90% of the market, right? If those five nodes dispute with, let's say the other 100,000 nodes on the network, right? It's not just about the numbers because the the, the 100,000 nodes, they have a little bit of an advantage because they might be able to, uh, you know, sort of prevent those transactions from getting to the five. But the five still, at the end of the day, if they're running the transaction volume for, you know, 90% of the capitalization of the market, they still have a lot of say. And so by delegating more and more power to these custodians, it's not just that they have the economic power and the ability to, uh, 
I guess like they can lose your funds, they can potentially steal your funds. Although uh, I don't think that theft is one of the things that people typically worry about, especially for the ones that are, you know, well established and good brands. But one of the things that we have to consider is that they actually start to accumulate more political power, right? Though I mean, the, the way that you just talked about the fact that Bitcoin Cash failed was that it resulted in a coin that was worth one percent of BTC, right, uh, of Bitcoin. Now, you could just as easily imagine a scenario where the people who are running large amounts of capital are the ones that get to, they might have more influence into the rules for that reason. Um, and so we, to, to, to distribute node operatorship, like a node operatorship is political power in Bitcoin. It is a, is a huge part of it. My, uh, honestly, mining contributing to the hash rate of the network is a form of political power in, in Bitcoin. And I actually really hope to see a future where mining is more distributed than it is today, right? Um, I think that I don't think we're under any sort of existential threat by minor centralization now or anytime soon. But uh, I think a, a, a future that I would be really happy to see is one where someone has a small miner in every home. Well, I mean, Again, in this idea of uh, Bitcoin is the catalyst for personal running personal servers, I think on the long enough time horizon, we do see that because yeah. this idea that the, there's unlimited energy in the universe and these miners, effectively what they allow a energy consumer to do is, is level out the amount of energy that they use to a consistent thing. So- you know, yeah. we have these things of uh, like peak hours and low hours, you know, of usage. And what that does is it actually makes it really hard and extra expensive to create energy for that. Um, it's better to create consistent energy and have consistent demand. So what you can do is use the in-between times to mine. And that is actually much more efficient because now you're always using consistent amount of energy. You're either using it for yourself or you're using it to secure you know, the global monetary system. It's uh, it really is an elegant, elegant solution. Um, and I do see that, like homes that need to, you know, be more efficient are going to start building in some sort of um, computing layer that is going to support, you know, a, a proof of work network. Yeah. Uh, I know far less about mining. I actually really uh, want like one of the, the things on my to-do list is to just talk to more people who are better in that space to really understand these, uh, the, the, what it's doing to energy markets. But yeah, like it, it definitely seems the, 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 the sort of misconception I think of three years ago is that Bitcoin is boiling the oceans and the most recent statistics show that the vast majority of it is done by renewables anyway, or at, I think it's called stranded energy or something like that. Energy that otherwise yep. wouldn't have a buyer. Perhaps one of the most interesting cases that I saw recently was that um, someone was saying that natural gas flares can be burned off for uh, uh, to, to, and, and it can be profitable to do so because you can use that energy for Bitcoin mining. And so you might say for a second, like, oh, hey, isn't that just burning more fossil fuels? And that's true. But on the other hand, as I understand it, methane, which is what natural gas flares are, is far more um, negatively impactful for things like climate change than the CO2 that would be resulting from burning it. So in, in some respects, you're actually improving the problem by burning the uh, burning off the excess rather than just letting it go up. Well, so the government is actually already mandating that all this methane be burnt. But, you know, if you were to think of it as a like stick or carrot mentality, the government saying you must burn this, you must do it. We're going to fly helicopters over your fields to make sure that you're actually doing this thing that costs you money. That's the stick mentality. Bitcoin is the carrot mentality. Hey, yep. burn this and we're going to pay you. We'll pay you sats to burn this and support the Bitcoin network. So if anything, if you're a climate activist, like we already know that positive reinforcement works better than <laughs> negative reinforcement. Like, you know, Bitcoin's the answer here. Yeah, not to mention it's like how much gas are you burning for those helicopters too, right? Like, <laughs> no one talks about how much gas that the government burns. It's yeah, like yeah. the majority of energy in the world like goes towards like militaries or something like that. Yeah, I mean Nick Carter was just talking about like when you can a lot of people compare like oh Bitcoin's cost per 
the energy cost per transaction is really, really high. And he was like, you gotta, you gotta compare apples to apples because unless you're considering the, uh, the energy footprint of the aircraft carriers that secure the, the, the OPEC deals that secure the U S dollar supremacy and, and thus the, the federal reserve system, then you're not really comparing apples to apples. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the same time, a lot of these attackers that we're kind of talking about could split off the Bitcoin network, create a corporate government Bitcoin. Um, you know, they have the aircraft carriers, right? Like yeah. this is, these are groups that, you know, have an enormous amount of power. And I think this is a good transition point to uh, the kind of second attack, which is like, the intermediate stage where a government bans Bitcoin usage from its citizens, AKA I would call it an attack on Bitcoiners. Yeah, exactly. And at that point, everybody's going to have a really hard choice. And I think like we're going to see there, there's a bunch of people like everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face, right? There's a bunch of people who say that they would be dissidents and when the rubber hits the road, they might actually capitulate. Right. Um, and I think that no, I, it's really hard to know which one you are until it happens. Like we, we can, and, and you know, you can try to prepare for it. And I think that you should prepare for it because it's not clear that uh, the government is going to sort of peacefully let this transition to a, uh, you know, a, a global neutral monetary system without trying to fight it. I mean, you see people on CNBC all the time trying to say like it needs to be regulated, it needs to be banned or whatever before it quote unquote gets out of control. Like there, like there are a decent port. It is not a rare occurrence for someone to have that opinion. And so, you know, is if they can summon the political will for it, you have to ask yourself: Are you willing to go to jail or leave the country uh, to, uh, you know, get get out from under these sorts of things? Um, and if it's a collective action problem. Obviously, if everyone refuses to submit, then like the, the government loses in pretty short order. But you know, the IRS is no stranger to making public executions of people to, to scare everyone else into compliance. Um, they don't need to go after everyone. So uh, that that's a that is a personal choice for everyone. It's one that should, everyone should be sort of mentally prepared for um, because it it might happen. Um, you know, of, of course, because Bitcoin is a global network, it's not like, I mean, you could just go to a more favorable regime and it's unlikely, except in the most egregious of cases that they would actually send people out to go, you know, uh, hunt down prominent Bitcoiners. I, I, it's just not worth their time. But, uh, you know, leaving the country is even onerous for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of like, what you mentioned with like you wanting to see miners decentralize more and become more evenly distributed. Like, um, I think, you know, it's a matter of will Bitcoiners start kind of leaving their countries and um, situating themselves in jurisdictions, situating Bitcoin wealth in jurisdictions that are going to be uh, ensure more favorable treatment. And how quickly does that happen before, uh, a you know hypothetical hammer comes down. Um, I personally am am hopeful that the game theory is working out. I think Lynn Alden on this podcast pointed out that the bigger Bitcoin gets, the more unlikely it is to get banned. Yeah, because, certainly. You know, right? we just saw Elon Musk jump in. Like, what happens if if a, an Apple or a Google jump in? Like now, right. like and these are the biggest people, lobbyists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those people have a lot of political influence, either directly through lobbyists or indirectly through the fact that they run massive corporations that pay a decent amount of taxes, right? Uh, and, and like ha risking, ex like lo losing industry to other countries is something that very much our, our country considers in, in its, uh, its de decisions around legislation and policy. Right. I mean, it's, it's constantly a thing in, uh, like political campaigning for trying to bring jobs back to America. But if you bring jobs back to America, you have to bring those companies back. And which means you have to create a favorable enough environment that they're actually going to do so. So I, it's again, it's far from a foregone conclusion that they will try to ban it. Like you're right, the bigger it gets, the, the less likely it is in terms of number of people. What you really don't want uh, is that if you don't want it to get really, really big by market capitalization, but still have it extremely concentrated in a few what were previously nobodies, right? Like if you have a whole bunch of people who 
or are only rich because of Bitcoin, um, you have a, a risk in that scenario. But every every moment like Tesla, every moment like um, MicroStrategy reduces the probability that these things are going to happen. Yeah. An interesting idea too is as corporations buy Bitcoin, like the S&P 500 is already the most widely owned asset. So they kind of like just initially, you know, they just kind of magically get, you know, exposure to Bitcoin. So right, yeah. uh, it is a pretty good distribution. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen MicroStrategy's uh, stock price start to track with Bitcoin. Like n- not completely, of course, they do have a separate business, but they own enough of it that it's like, okay, these things are actually correlated, which at some point that means that people who own those stocks have exposure to Bitcoin indirectly. And so, yeah, if everyone has exposure, then banning it outright seems impracticable. So let's talk a little bit on like percentages, like at this moment, based on the trajectory of both Bitcoin adoption from kind of like big corporations, as well as, you know, potentially even a jurisdiction soon. Um, do you think from a scaling perspective that there's like, uh, you know, kind of a usability attack vector, right? So lots of people adopt it. Bitcoin can't scale to that level um, in a not, in a decentralized way. That kind of creates centralization and attack vector from forking to a gov corp coin. Yeah, so I think that the, the corporate use cases are actually not worrying me much from a scaling perspective Be, because I think they understand that this is a long-term, like it, they're deep freezing their value, so to speak, on their balance sheet. They're like, we're putting this away for maybe a decade. We don't need access to it. Or they're wanting some sort of asymmetric upside. What's inter- what's the, the more concerning thing is that uh, what it does is it signals to the public that this is going mainstream and then they all jump in and they have the expectation that they're going to trade it or at least transact with it in a somewhat instantaneous way. And that might not materialize. And we have what I would describe as at this point, we have an excellent user experience around interacting with layer one, with the blockchain itself, with wallets, hardware wallets, all that stuff, I think is a really, really, really good experience where we lack the user experience is for uh, the the higher level stuff like L2 or even things like Liquid or uh, you know other non-base chain solutions. They don't have, it's not that they don't exist. They are also like, decentralized and, and uh, yeah. kind of uh, non-custodial. That is the key. Cause exactly. we like Coinbase is a custodial. It's like, give us the Bitcoin and then you can play on our server. Right. And right. then we'll give you back the Bitcoin later if you want, if you ask for it. But that's different than Lightning, which is yes. like you always have the Bitcoin, but yet it is kind of transactionally scalable. Exactly. Yeah. And and the, the reality of it today is that uh, Lightning does not have a first class user experience yet. It just doesn't. Um, it, we, we're working to make it easier every day. And I think it's orders of magnitude better today than it was a year ago. Um and I expect that to continue. It's it's one of those things. It's like it's not like we're really going to miss the mark in some sort of permanent way, right? The worst that it's going to happen is that you know a, we have this massive influx of, of people who try to come in and, and transact with it. A lot of them get disappointed and then they leave, uh, and then we'll just keep working on it and making it better. Uh, but you know, if we want to support some of these games, like I I personally am of the opinion that it's better for everyone if Bitcoin it price-wise is appreciating at a slower, steadier rate than rather than having these like massive bull cycles and then blowing off a ton of value. And the reason that those massive bull cycles and blowing off a ton of value happens is because it's mismatch between the expectations and reality. And so as we if we can control expectations and you know work hard to make reality try to meet them, then a lot of that volatility goes away, which actually in, in a way increases the value of Bitcoin uh, as the volatility goes down too. Well, I think that's a matter of time, but uh, there's absolutely a benefit to kind of like the volatility. Um, oh, it gets people sure. excited. It, it's uh, it's absolutely like a, a massive kind of PR machine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, every every year Bitcoin is actually less volatile. Um, yep, you know, right. there's a lot of big having kind of drama that happens every four years, but that's kind of it's pretty obvious that that has to do with the supply being cut in half. Um, yeah. but even still like that's gonna, I personally think that that's going to matter less and less as kind of like the real Bitcoin ecosystem economy, um, gets built out. So, uh, I think you're, you're, 
you're correct to point out those things, but at the same time, it, it's it's kind of part of the adoption cycle. It's like inevitable. Yeah, yeah. I I don't want to to come off in any way saying that these these things are things that they make Bitcoin bad or things that doom it. It's just like these are things that I think about about how to allocate my own efforts in order to improve both the probability of success and the total outcome of that success. Um, because I, I mean, like, and, and another one of those things that I think about a lot is like the the, the meme of twenty one million is extremely powerful, right? Uh, having a finite cap asset is historically unprecedented, and it is it it opens the door to uh, an entirely new economic reality that we've never had before. Um, but one of the th- and I, I, we we talked about this a little bit in the run up to this podcast. But one of the things that a lot of people talk about is this something that's coined as the minor death spiral, which is this idea that you know a lot of people have opined on you know Bitcoin's incentive structure deteriorating over time and like you know massive chain reorgs happening and whatnot. So, and these the people who say that this is definitely going to happen don't know what they're talking about. The people who say that this is definitely not going to happen also don't really know what they're talking about. The truth is, in my at least in my opinion, I think I don't think anyone knows exactly how this is going to play out, and by ignoring it, we actually uh, hurt our chances of being able to keep the twenty-one million. I think it's so important that we try to keep it, but it's not going to be an easy thing to try to keep. Right? We have to fight for it and come up with all sorts of clever solutions, and make sure that the incentive structure of the the layers we build on top of Bitcoin are compatible uh, with being able to keep that stuff. So part of my sort of free time research is going into figuring out uh, more details around how quote unquote late stage uh, minor incentives work, right? Now, so far we have pretty good indicators that things are progressing nicely, right? Fees account for about 15% of the block reward as of today, which is not small by any means. And as you know, if you know, as long as Bitcoin's value rises uh, over the next you know several years, which I you know, as long as people, as long as there are people in the world that don't own Bitcoin, that's going to continue happening, uh, because as more people adopt it and the fixed supply uh, continues to play out, you'll see that that rise in value. And as long as we don't see a precipitous drop in hash rate, uh, we'll be able to keep the the massive reorgs from happening. So. Uh, but but it will require like making sure that we can continue to get those keep those hash rate numbers up, which requires research even into the hardware space of like how do we even make ASICs like more efficient. Um, and yeah. this is far I, outside I of my I'm, own realm. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those uh, ignorant people that thinks it's not a problem whatsoever. But um, yeah, maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I I mean well, I, I I I feel good for one reason, and that is because. Uh, something I explained earlier, it's the utility of proof of work. It's having this Mm -hmm. global buyer of energy of last resort. Like I see that as like, as the Bitcoin, as the Bitcoin synthetic block reward dissipates, it's the, the earth's natural block reward becomes more and more accessible. Right. And effectively what proof of work allows is energy production that, was uh that was a negative sum right like it, it cost mm-hmm. you money it hurt you it was not profitable um you had to find ways uh to kind of work around it it just monetizes that directly that in itself is kind of like a block a block subsidy right yeah that and that may very well fix it so yeah right? and so again I, I, that that's kind of my thinking there but i mean i, I definitely like every developer I've, I've spoken to their mentality is very similar to yours which is like whoa, this thing is not done yet. Like there's a lot of building to do. Um, and whereas a lot of the kind of uh, Bitcoin cheerleaders like me on the internet, uh, we, we're feeling a lot more confident. Um, one of the things that we push hard is, and maybe not we, but you know, this is a strong meme is this idea of ossification. What, how, mm-hmm. do, how do you feel about ossification? And is that an attack vector? Uh, as in, so uh, ossification as in the protocol stops changing. Sure. I mean, like, I think that ossification is a very nuanced thing. Like, I would hope that 21 million in the hard cap is ossified. But at the same time, like, I think that there's other areas that are being worked on. But there are other there are some Bitcoiners who will say, like, 
it's best if we just stop working on everything and it just stays the same. That's the most trustless way to use Bitcoin. Uh, so that I don't think that stopping working on it is a good idea by any stretch of the mad the imagination. The, I think the people who are talking about protocol ossification are talking about something very specific, which is just having stable rules. Um, and in that sense, like I think ossifications are really important. I think hard forks are extremely harmful to the ecosystem. It's one of my main gripes with Ethereum, right? Is that when you imbue a central organization, or at least even if it's not a formal organization, if you imbue a few minds with the power to be able to decide on non-backwards compatible changes, you have uh, extreme amounts of uh, risk around, uh, you lose the idea that this is a, a uh, system with no governing authority because whoever can control the non-backwards compatible change or influence the non-backwards compatible changes has de facto authority in the system. So I, I, I hope and I believe strongly that we will never see a Bitcoin hard fork ever again, even though there's this giant hard fork wish list. Um, I don't think we're going to see it. I hope we don't see it because it's, it is a very perilous path for us. That said, not all not all protocol changes are non-backwards compatible, right? Soft forks, by definition, are backwards compatible. Um, and there are good and bad forms of soft forks. But one of the things that we earned with the way that SegWit went down in 2017 is we got this script versioning system, which is an opt-in method of creating new rules. So this is actually how Taproot is going to work as well. When, if and, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say when Taproot gets deployed, uh, it's going to be in a way where if you don't want to touch Taproot, if you don't, if you don't trust the implementation, if you want to see other people get shot through the door first, uh, you can do that. You are not put at risk by holding your funds on previous ver like uh, script versions, and you can let other let, let, you can let other people experiment with it on mainnet first before you dive head first, and you will be completely unaffected. Um, and so those types of changes, I think, are really good, right? I think that the more useful that we make Bitcoin, the more uh, we can avoid the, the spurious incentives that might have people going off into altcoins. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, that altcoins very much, they, 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 they're, of course, they're a form of postmodern money, in my opinion, right? It's like you, you get, we, we, I don't know about you, but I kind of get into this mode a lot in 2020 slash 2021 where it's like, I, can, I don't even know what to believe anymore because so much information can be manufactured out of thin air and can have absolutely no basis in truth. And I very much feel like altcoins are tenuously walking that line too, right? Like it's, even if they provide value, the have, having so many choices between them can make it really, really hard for anybody to know what's valuable and what's not. And given that money is the most powerful tool for human cooperation that we have ever seen in human history, I think fucking with that is is dangerous, right? And so if Bitcoin is routinely unable to deliver on the things that people want to do with it, then we run the risk of uh, people getting lured into altcoin you know, uh, confusion, so to speak. Yo, so actually, so, I want to riff on that. So I have opinions there. And uh, uh, I, it, what you consider to be postmodern money, I, I just call it skeuomorphic, uh, especially okay. DeFi. I call it really skeuomorphic. And for listeners who don't know what skeuomorphic is, a great example of this is an analog calculator looks a certain way. But guess what? The calculator on your computer, it's skewed, even though it's a completely digital thing, to also look like your analog calculator. So that's an example of skeuomorphic design. So I think DeFi is, is skeuomorphic. You know, it's very much like, what does our financial system look like today? How do we make this more efficient? How do we make smart contracts do this exact same stuff? And they kind of miss the point of Bitcoin, which is like a new operating system for communicating value. Um, yeah, the, I think the real DeFi opportunities, right, to sort of steal the term, are come from things like uh, uh, like like Lightning inbound liquidity, right? Where's the corollary in that for, of that for the traditional financial system? Like we created a market, like like uh, Lightning Labs just recently re uh, released a paper for something called Lightning Pool. I don't know if Bitcoin Magazine has covered that or not, but oh, we have it, a bunch. Okay, yeah. I mean, so for the listeners that aren't aware, it's this, it's a basically a market where you can purchase for a fee inbound liquidity. 
and it is a market-based solution and a financial product that was designed to solve a Bitcoin or designed to solve a problem that exists natively to Bitcoin only because of Bitcoin's fundamental structure. And I think that, you know, the more we, we figure out financial products like that, the more certain we can be that they're going to last and that they're not, like you're saying, skeuomorphic, or that we're just sort of copying things that we've seen in the past without really giving a rigorous analysis to whether they're fundamentally needed or not. Yeah. And to kind of add on that, though, so your angle on like, okay, people stumbling upon altcoin confusion because Bitcoin didn't deliver for them. I think that's absolutely a perspective and maybe a threat. But on the flip side, I see altcoins as kind of like filling in the gaps of Bitcoin, especially for people who are not Bitcoin oriented yet. Like Bitcoin is literally a new operating system for viewing and communicating value. So like most people are still on the legacy system mindset. They have not bridged over to the Bitcoin mindset, the new operating system. They have to upgrade. So, I mean, altcoins can sometimes serve as like a, a beachhead to start to inch them closer to, to get them more exposed to Bitcoiners and people who've already switched their mindset. So, um, you know, yeah, there's negatives, but I also kind of see like there's a psychological positive for having them around. Yeah. And uh, like one of the things that I want to comment on is that when I say making the script version or the script system more capable, you know, a lot of people might sort of infer like, oh, well, like, well, yeah, stuff, stuff like Taproot. Uh, I mean, like SegWit's the thing that in, introduced the, the versioning system to begin with, but Taproot's like the first real like usage of it. Um, but uh, there are there are things even on Bitcoin that are working to get even further than that, which is uh, like one of the projects that I've contributed to, at least uh, modestly, is uh, Simplicity over at Blockstream, which is a, I, without getting into like ultra technical details, it's, in my opinion, the, the, it is as capable as a sanely designed script versioning system can be. And the reason that I qualify it as such is that one of the things that Ethereum purports to have is Turing completeness, which uh, for it basically says that anything a computer can do, the Ethereum virtual machine can do. But one of the problems with that is that you, by computers have this a really annoying property that was proven by Alan Turing uh, in the middle of last century, that uh, you can't understand the how a program is going to run until you run it. Um, and that's just due to the properties of computing. And that's that's fundamentally not something that we want out of any sort of financial contract, right? You don't just want to see, you don't want to write up a contract and be like, ah, we'll see how this plays out, right? Like, no, you got billions of dollars on the line. You want to really understand how that thing's going to work. Um, and so being able to have a, a system that is as capable as it can be without sacrificing the ability to know what's going to happen in advance, I think is a good thing, right? Because that way you're not needlessly limiting people, but you're also not sacrificing this really important property of, of being able to understand the, the code that you write. Okay. So we, this is a extremely wide ranging conversation. I, yeah. I think it was one of my favorite podcasts that I've done in a while. So thank you for, for coming on and, and bringing it truly. Um, want to give you a chance to give our, our listeners a, a last word, you know, why don't you kind of tell them, you know, whatever, whatever you need to, to, to wrap this conversation up. If there's one thing I want to leave the listeners with out of this conversation is that every single one of you has unique skills to bring to the table and Bitcoin doesn't work without lots and lots of hard people, uh, hardworking people working on it. So also very hard people. Oh, also hard people. Yeah. So, uh, what, like, there, there is, if you think that you don't have what it takes to contribute to Bitcoin, I think you're wrong. So uh, like whatever you can to, to help, like we can use it. So uh, whether that's education, technical contributions, marketing, uh, you know, uh, j just even feedback on the user experience, being able to tell the people who make these products uh, what ways that you don't like them or ways that they can be better. Uh, that all helps. And uh, engaging in those ways, I think really, really helps us. Cool. Well, uh, Keegan, why don't you plug yourself one more time and tell people uh, where they can find you in the, the embassy? Yeah. So uh, my name is Keegan McClelland. You can find me on Twitter at Proof of Keegs. I recently got on Clubhouse at Proof of Keegs as well. 
uh, and uh, the embassy uh, is a pro is a, the flagship product of Start Nine Labs, and you can find Start Nine Labs at on Twitter at Start Nine Labs and at Start Nine Labs dot com. And if you don't have a, a node up and running, uh, I strongly encourage you get one up and running. And I don't think that, that you know you'll have a better experience than the one that you have with the embassy. So. All right. Awesome. All right, guys, you can find me at CK underscore snarks, both on Twitter and at Bitcoin magazine. Um, make sure to give us a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, actually those five-star reviews as well. So don't forget to give us a five-star review on iTunes and uh, check out Keegan. Really good stuff on this podcast. Going to have to get you back on and uh, maybe on a Bitcoin ha magazine happy hour as well. So uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, but until then, catch you all later. Peace.